Montebello coin and I watch rock and roll all night. Started to shift. People kind of, you know, started to go their own way. 
but I think probably that's the one thing that helped KISS become successful, is they really stuck together and no one went against them. And I would say that out of all the crazy things that we did, we won way more than we lost. I mean, this is all that is about if you win more than you lose, if you win 51% of the time, you're a success. Well, I'll bet you we won 80% of the time. The 20% that we lost, you guys never heard of it. Just, it was just, we just won so much of the time. And, uh, I mean, there were things, I'll give you an example. Uh, when we did Cadillac, Michigan, uh, the guys were a little bit, what are we going to Cadillac for? And how come we're going to this high school? And uh, we still weren't making very much money then. And we did a, we had a film crew that we could only afford so much film, I remember. We couldn't even afford to develop it after we shot it. And uh, once we got there, we had planned a whole day, including them riding in a helicopter, leaving them leaving the football field, and if the team didn't want to go up in a helicopter, and it was all sorts of little problems. But they did it, because that's what we said we do. And they didn't realize that the whole town was going to turn up in kiss makeup, and the mayor and the senator, and it's going to be in kiss makeup. I mean, it was really something. But before we actually got there, it was a lot of truth. A lot of times when you plan things that you think are going to be great, I mean, fortunately for us, most of them work. But there was always a lot of insecurity, like anyone would go through. I got one. Go ahead. Uh, the very first promotion tour, it was my understanding that there wasn't a whole lot of promotion money for the record. Though. And I understand that your personal American Express yeah. bill was um, quite high. Quite ahead. Yeah. yeah, that's an old story, which you probably all heard. If we were doing this, it was a new record label, uh, Casablanca. Casablanca was being funded by Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers hated this. I mean, point blank, they just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And they told Neil Bogart that he should think about doing something else, not with this group with the makeup, basically. Neil said no, he really wanted to go through with it. So an executive of Warner's, I, mean, I, I still don't know who put it out, but out a secret memo, inter-office memo, saying not to work with his that uh, Neil would come up with some better product, but don't worry, not to work with his group because it was not going anywhere. Well, Neil had gotten to know some, some of the people at Warner Brothers, and someone passed him the secret memo. Neil went nuts. Went in and talked to the two heads of Warner Brothers, and they finally came to the point where it was even more. So Neil said, okay, I want to leave. They made him a deal to leave, and then Neil mortgaged his home and continued paying for the record level. Well, that didn't last long. All of a sudden, all of us were out of money. And so I had an American Express card, which I don't think I had put. If I had spent $100 a month on that, that was big time. So uh, one month, I put about $25,000. <laughs> I had to go to her, and I got a call after the 30 days, you know, and they said, uh, Mr. O'Coin, we see that you put $25,000, but you've never spent any more than about $100. Do you expect to pay this? And I said, absolutely, oh, yeah. we have this whole new thing happening, it's no problem at all. Knowing done well, there wasn't a penny. And uh, so after a few weeks, when they called me back, we haven't done your payment. And I, I remember, I said, well, uh, oh, we had an unfortunate problem, and the money didn't come in, but don't worry, I'll pay it off a little at a time. And they let me do that. Now, today, they, they wouldn't. They didn't take my card away or anything. And today, it would just be cut off or anything, but yeah, that's how it happened. That's how we got the first tour going. Thing you're most proudest of with kids, you think you're most embarrassed. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm pretty proud of all of it. I don't think that I don't really think there's too many embarrassing things. After all, we're in the entertainment business, and, and it's music and it's rock and roll. And everyone's had their ups and downs and the crazy. So I don't think you know. I think if anything, anytime you have a chance to be part of something that's as great as it's been for as many years, yeah, it's been pretty good. Have you heard anything about the free show that they were talking about doing and what are the chances of it being Central Park and what are your thoughts about being Central Park? Uh, I don't, uh, somehow I don't think it will be, uh, but I, you know, they keep talking about it. Those are one of those things just like the movie and the Broadway show and, the, and another book and another another uh, convention tour and another world tour. Everything is still up in the air, but everything is being worked on. Every time I have talk to you, well, oh yeah, we're doing it all. So until it's not done, it's big. If they did that, well, how do you think it would go over? Uh, and, and I think it might be a little tough in the middle of uh, Central Park, unless their next album does very well. 
if their next album does well, uh, and if they've taken enough time to really make it a great kiss album. You know, a lot of the albums were done really quick, and uh, some of them certainly not as good as others. I think this album has to be a great album. If it's a great album, then I think they can do it. We all know about East really like wild past, but what was the thing that really, of all things, sticks out in your mind more than anything? And, and what was the reaction after the Tom Snyder show? Well, Tom Snyder, I mean, I loved it because you know, I was so used to Dean and Paul monopolizing everything that I just, I just loved it. And so, and it was very good. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily good between him and Gene and Paul, but it was, it, the reaction was great, very good. Uh, you got to remember that Ace, Ace is uh, very bright, and I've always considered Ace to be a, you know, an incredible human being. I mean, he's, he's obviously a little crazy now and then, but he, if there was anyone who would take the shirt off his back to help you, it would be Ace. And he was always that way. You know? So you got to remember, I mean, it's, it, there are certain qualities that you get to know people, and that was, uh, that was one of the great qualities about Ace. He was always there for you. Hi, Bill. I was wondering, um, when you were working with a lot of other bands besides KISS, personally, I was a big fan of Piper. Right. I was wondering, of all the other bands you managed, which one most disappointed you that it didn't you know, pan out like you thought they were going to be as big as KISS or whatever? <laughs> you better. I'd have to say Stars. Yeah, I know. Well, I think I thought that Stars could have gone on to do more than we did. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of inner conflict at the end that particular band as well, leaving Capital at the time and a few other things that didn't even do. But ultimately, I thought it was a good band, and I thought Michael Lee Smith really was a great writer. And in fact, if you go back and listen to some of those albums they did, it was some great material. Uh, Piper, when I found Billy Squire, uh, Billy was in Boston, and Billy, he was leaving another band. He had been playing in another band called Sidewinders. And he, um, I brought him to New York, and uh, we were putting a band together. And initially, he was a little afraid of being on his own. And so we put the band together. Piper signed to A&M. Uh, every artist has his own threshold of what they can deal with and what they can. Billy is, uh, is a guy who really is, is himself. He has a very hard time dealing a lot with, with uh, in a community of, of like a, a band. He knows what he wants, that's what he wants, and that's it. So by the time we finished with a couple of Piper albums, it wasn't really going the way we thought it would. And I suggested to him that he really do a solo career, because I really felt that his personality wouldn't really fit into a, to a band situation. And I thought he was also strong enough that he'd gone through enough of the process of the industry that he could stand on his own, and it finally worked out for him. I just just one other quick question. You said that KISS was successful 80% of the time, basically? Oh, yeah. We, we, was, had, we, we got away with a lot of things that most bands wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been able to do. But what was your reaction to the KISS and Cell book, where it said, basically, that they were always broke and just on, on the brink of never having uh, enough well, that's, not, that's not really true. I mean, I have to tell you, that it's not true. At the time, at the time that supposedly they were all broke, they were all living on about a million, two, million, three a year. Uh, to live, and it was money. Right? The problem that happened during that time is, is that we, we were kind of caught in a, uh, in a catch-22, in, in a sense that we couldn't really decide not to do the Kiss show. The Kiss show is what really helped develop Kiss. Uh, and the show would maybe just barely sell out one night. So when you have a show that's, and, and the last show that we really did, the huge show, which was the one in 80, which was just enormous, it, you know, we did 78, in 80, the shows were just enormous. And, uh, of course, everyone started to complain because I mean, by that time, they had a, a, an entourage of lawyers and business people and everyone else was either getting commissions or pieces or this or that. So it wasn't that they weren't just making money, a lot of other people weren't either. Uh, and no one ever equated it necessarily to the album sales. I mean, and I knew that in my mind, I couldn't, I couldn't just take the show away. Like, this would walk on stage with nothing. I, you know, I, the fans expected something, so I, my, my feeling was we had to maintain a certain level of show, even if the albums weren't selling, hoping that eventually it would start come back again and put on another great album. Uh, so during those years, those last few years, 
the albums weren't selling that much. It was really almost a break-even situation on the road, but no one was making big money. But they were still living as well as they ever were, I'll tell you that. Yeah, um, you in anyone's life, everyone's had their moments with, with each other. I've had my moments with Gene and Paul and, uh, and Peter and Ace have and vice versa. You know, there's always been a time when either I made a decision they didn't like or one of them made a decision we didn't like or whatever. So everyone's had their moment. Yeah. You got one more? Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay. I've seen the early pictures of uh, you and a female named Joyce Byers. Right. Yeah. What was her involvement with the band? And uh, I read somewhere a while ago that she never really liked your ideas as far as taking the band to the next level, and she was kind of voted out. No, that's not, that's not really true at all. Uh, that's one of those stories that got nowhere to get started. Joyce was a, a, a very bright young gal that I met at the New School in New York, and I met her when I was doing a, a feature film. And uh, there wasn't enough money in the budget to have an assistant. So I went to the new school and I asked one of the professors, I said, is there someone really bright, really wants to get into film, that would really help me and I'll pay her expenses but I can't afford to pay uh, salary. And he introduced me to Joyce Byers. Incredible guy. I mean, really bright, fun, I mean, very together. And uh, Joyce then moved on and did the show Flipside with me. And she was my production assistant all through the television show. And then when I decided to jump into management, I said, Joyce, why don't you come, we'll do it together. Because she just was a really great person. And uh, during that time, she got to meet Neil Bogart. Uh, and Neil and her fell in love. And uh, they, you know, she eventually left New York, moved out to be with me, and finally married her. She became Mr. Bogart. That's what happened. There wasn't any. The only time we ever had a, had a problem was when I threatened to leave Casablanca. At that time, it was a, it was a few months of craziness then. But that's all. Yeah. What happened to the Kiss World Park that you were going to have? Uh, ah, yeah. yes. Well, the Kiss World Parks I, I wanted to do uh, at the time that things were starting to get a little shaky. You know, uh, everyone else was talking about we should be making more money, we should be doing this, we can't afford that. Uh, uh, I was getting more concerned about the albums that really weren't you know, coming together as well. But my next thing was, after doing the next shows, you, know, you can only go so far with shows. The last big show we did, we had 16 semis hopscotching all over the country. It was an enormous thing. Uh, and, uh, I'll, if someone reminds me, I'll tell you a story about that tour and how crazy it got. But uh, the next thing I thought was to kind of make it a kiss world so that what we'd do is we'd come into town for a week and we'd kind of make different things happen, you know, and it would be a whole new concept of how to do it, which, of course, the guys liked initially, and then, and then everyone else kind of shot it down and said, we can't do it, it won't work, and it'll cost too much money, and so forth. So that's what happened. Well, tell us that story. Uh, the story about the, the ma major show we did, I think, in 80, 79, 80, it was 80, and uh, 16 seminars. Wow. Uh, we, we started rehearsing in Florida, and we are uh, working our way up through Florida and up the East Coast, and we get to Atlanta. We're playing the Omni in Atlanta. And I get a call. I had been with them through rehearsals and everything else, and I think before they went to Georgia, I left them to go to New York. I get a call. You better come down right away. This show is too big. We can't do this. It's not working. We're, we, everyone's going to quit. That was the, the message I got. So I get a plane. I get down to, to Atlanta. And I get there and I see my, I take all the heads of the different departments in the show that big. You have different heads. You know, one for sound, one for production, one for, for all sorts of different things. And I have about eight of them. And I said, okay, come on, let's go have a meeting. And basically, my, my production manager says to me, look it, we've done this show now for a week or two, and it doesn't work, and uh, we just don't want to do this anymore. Uh, we think you should take the show off the road. Now, we've already spent millions of dollars, and there's no way it was coming off the road, but yeah, 
basically everyone who was ready to quit because it was such a hard show to do. And I learned a big lesson this time because I realized that through all the rehearsals and everything else, there was so much to do that no one had seen the show. Oh, as I knew what the show was supposed to look like, but all my different departments only knew what they had to do, and everything was so hard that they never really saw the show. They were just too busy just trying to get their, their act together in their own department. And uh, a big lesson, you should always let everyone know what the show should be. Anyway, uh, so when I realized that they were talking to me, that they really hadn't seen the show. They were just so wrapped up in what they were doing, they had no clue about what it was supposed to look like. So they obviously couldn't get excited about it, because all they were doing was working their butts off. So I said, okay, let's go through it, and I explained the show. And then I said, everyone go and check what has to be done, make sure everything is, is set up properly and everything else. And I explained how it was supposed to look. Because I had never done this. It was really stupid. I didn't, but I did. Somehow, I had never sent everyone down and said, here's how the show is supposed to look. You see, this happens here because, and when G does this, or when Paul does that, this happens. You understand why it happens now? I never did that. Uh, so in any case, now I'm telling them all this. And, and I had to make a decision then about how to get them either to be with me or not, because they were ready to quit. And I couldn't be guaranteed that the show would work or not. Uh, so I really, I said to them, even though I really, I didn't really mean this, but I had to say it anyway. I said, look, if the show doesn't work tonight, we'll take it off the road. Well, we couldn't afford to take it off the road, but I knew they couldn't argue with me on it. How could they argue? They're telling me it should be off the road. I'm saying, okay, if it doesn't work tonight, we'll take it off the road. Okay, so that argument went away. Thinking in their mind, if it doesn't work, we're going to take it off. He already promised that. Okay, fine. So everyone goes and checks everything. If it's fine, we have another meeting. I, I explained some other things to him, and I said, listen, just double check everything again, see if you're comfortable the way the show is. Everything okay? Fine. And tonight, now that you know everything is, you've double checked it twice, I want you to really pay attention and watch the show. Right? So that night, in the Omni in Atlanta, the show went perfectly. And at the end of the night, every, all the production people came up and said, oh my God, we got the best show on the road. We'll do it, we'll do it. But it was that close to having the whole show shut down. And, uh, but I made a major mistake. It was like I never explained. We had such a big show and so many people working on it that I had never explained what the show should look like. I just assumed everyone would see it as we went through rehearsals. And everyone was too busy. To see. Hi, Bill. I began this before. Do you think that your friendship with Gene Paul hurt in the marketing group when they got the rights back? Because I always got the impression that Ross Perot would have threw them out of the office and said, get out of here, guys. Did well, your friendship hurt you with that? Well, it was, uh, I, don't, I think a lot of other people talked about it. Initially, I, uh, I own half of all of that. And uh, when we renegotiated the contract, I gave it back to them. And uh, I, the only conflict we ever had, really, because we all made enough money from it, uh, was really toward the end, when I departed, and everything. They wanted to stop all of it. They felt it was all too much kiddie stuff. And, uh, they didn't want to get rid of the makeup. They didn't want to have merchandising anymore because that was too kiddie stuff. And, they, and that, that was so everything was stopping. And we have to understand that during the years that I worked with them, to keep everything together, to work with copyrights, and the, it took me five years to copyright their faces in the Library of Congress. Five years work, and all of a sudden, by the time we got it, a year later, they went to take it off. I mean, it was so there was a lot of work that they never really knew. They didn't know what was happening a lot behind the scenes to keep everything going. So, from that point of view, it was really disappointing. You know, and anything that's emotional or creative, you know, if it gets to be that disappointing, all of a sudden the friction happens, and that probably was the beginning of how we started to separate. Thank you. 
because I know there's, there's a life in the group that's very interesting as well. However, after everything you've been through with the group, what would you have done different if you could do it again? The only thing that I, I know it was special enough that we haven't gotten into so much of so many emotional uh, phrases as Kate has. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like, again, I told you, it's like a marriage. You know, you get to know each other very well. And sometimes you're, you're less forgiving about things than you should on both sides, myself as well as them. It's like, it's really like a marriage. And you get to know someone, you take things out on each other, and you kind of, you know, if you know how to push each button, there's some buttons, you know, if they can push my buttons by the end, and I can push their buttons. Really easy. And, uh, you know, I think probably a little less of that would have been nice, and we might have been able to do some more things. Don't forget, we were breaking new ground all the time, doing things no one else had ever done. So from that point of view, that was the most exciting thing for me. When we started turning about, well, you know, turning on each other, you know, and, and again, our marriages and relationships and businesses go through these problems too, it would probably would have been nice if we had a little more insight into how to avoid some of that. But other than that, it was it was pretty incredible. It was really great. I hope all of you have a chance to go through like something like this in your life because it's it's quite amazing. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bill. Yeah.